This document delivers an advanced course on IP route selection rules. This section mainly describes the longest match principle of IP routing, floating static routes, and BFD. First, let's talk about the longest match principle of IP routing. Before we get started, let's quickly review some basic concepts involved in IP routing. When a router or device capable of IP routing receives an IP data packet, it obtains the destination IP address from the packet's IP header and searches its routing table for a routing entry that best matches the destination IP address. If such a routing entry is available, it forwards the packet based on the outbound interface and next hop IP address of the entry. If no such routing entry is available, it checks whether there is a default route. If there is no default route, it discards the IP packet and sends an ICMP unreachable message to the source IP address of the packet to notify the sender that the packet is discarded. Now, let's talk about the longest match principle, which is used for IP route selection. There are many types of routes, for example, host routes, subnet routes, summary routes, major network routes, supernet routes, and default routes. Major networks and supernets are related. Use the IP address 172.16.2.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.
we can see that the bit marked in red does not match the counterpart in the destination IP address. Therefore, Route 1 is not the one we're looking for. The prefix of the route on interface S1 best matches the destination IP address. If S1 encounters a physical fault and cannot forward data traffic, this packet is forwarded through S2. This is because S2 has a route that matches but is not the best match for the packet. This is how the longest match principle works. Router R1 has three outbound interfaces, S0, S1, and S2. A summarized routing table of R1 is shown on the left. If R1 receives a data packet with a destination IP address of 172.16.1.1, R1 forwards the packet through S0 because its route best matches the destination IP address of the packet. If R1 receives a data packet with the destination IP address of 172.16.2.1, R1 forwards the packet through S1 because its route best matches the destination IP address of the packet. Although the default route also matches the destination IP address of the packet, the packet is forwarded through S1 according to the longest match principle. If R1 receives a data packet with the destination IP address, of 172.17.1.1, R1 forwards the packet through S2 default route because the routes of the other two interfaces do not match the destination IP address of the packet. Here is a summary of IP route selection. Different prefixes in the routing table belong to different routes. If the prefixes of two routes are the same, the route whose protocol has a higher priority is added to the routing table. If both the prefixes and protocols of two routes are the same, the route whose cost is smaller is added to the routing table. Routers search the routing table for a route that best matches the destination IP address of each packet by matching route prefixes against the destination IP address bit by bit according to the longest match principle. If a route that matches the destination IP address is available, the packet is directly forwarded according to the route that best matches the destination IP address. If no such route is available, the packet is forwarded according to the default route. If no default route exists, the packet is discarded. Packets are forwarded hop by hop, Therefore, all routers along the path to the destination network must have a route that matches the destination network. Otherwise, packet loss occurs. Communication requires round-trip routes. Therefore, routes must be available for the packets to travel back from the destination network. Next, let's talk about floating static routes and the problem caused by route summarization. Routers R1 R2 and R3 form a network. Two static routes are configured on R3 to allow it to access the network, 10.9.9.0/24 through R1 or R2. The priorities of the two static routes are both the default value 60 and the costs are both zero, indicating that the two static routes are equal cost routes and are both added to the routing table. In some cases, it is required that traffic be forwarded through a specified link. For example, it is required that traffic from R3 to network 10.9.9.0/24 be forwarded along the link between R1 and R3 under normal circumstances, and along the link between R2 and R3 if the link between R1 and R3 fails. To meet this requirement, we can configure a floating static route. Specifically, when configuring static routes, set the priority of the static route with R2 as the next hop to 80, and keep the default priority, 60, for the static route with R1 as the next hop. In this way, 
traffic destined for the network 10.9.9.0/24 is preferentially forwarded along the link between R1 and R3. If the link between R1 and R3 fails, the traffic is forwarded through R2. Route summarization reduces the routing table size and router resource consumption without compromising network reachability. R2 is an egress router, and R1 is a gateway device that is connected to four subnets. A static route is configured on R1 to ensure that these subnets can access the internet. Because data communication is bidirectional, static routes must also be configured on R3 to access the four subnets. To reduce the size of the routing table on R2, we can configure a summary route using the IP route static 192.168.0.0.16.10.1.12.1 command on R2. However, the summary route may cause routing loops. If a PC connected to R1 is attacked by viruses, the PC sends a large number of intranet scanning packets and the destination IP address of the packets may be a non-existent intranet IP address that belongs to network 192.168.0.0. Data traffic matches the default route on R1 and therefore the traffic is forwarded to R2. R2 happens to have the summary route 192.168.0.0. Therefore, R2 sends the traffic back to R1, which forms a routing loop on the link between R1 and R2. In addition to a large number of IP packets, the link has to carry the heavy traffic sent by the subnets. As a result, the TTL mechanism of IP packets cannot prevent the routing loops. This problem may consume a lot of resources on the two routers. To address this problem, we can run the IP route static 192.168.0.0.16 null zero command to configure a black hole route. Interface null zero can be regarded as a trash can on a router. All data traffic that the black hole route matches will be forwarded to interface null zero and then discarded. For example, if an intranet PC tries to access network 192.168.5.0/24, the PC's traffic will be discarded by R1 because only the black hole route on R1 matches the traffic. If an intranet PC tries to access network 192.168.3.0/24, R1 forwards the traffic according to the direct route 192.168.3.0/24 in its routing table because the route best matches the traffic according to the longest match principle. The black hole route prevents routing loops and ensures network reachability. Last but not least, let's talk about BFD for static routes. Static routes cannot dynamically respond to network changes. In this figure, a layer 2 switch exists between R1 and R2, and a static route destined for network 2.2.2.2/24 is configured on R1. If the link between R2 and the layer 2 switch fails, R1 is not aware of the failure. Therefore, the static route is still available in the routing table of R1. To enable R1 and R2 to know the status of each other, we can associate a BFD session with a static route by specifying track BFD session BFD12 when configuring the static route. After a BFD session is associated with the static route on one router, the session regularly detects the reachability of the other router. If BFD finds that the other router is unreachable, the local router sets the static route as down, indicating that the static route cannot be used. 
Now, let's talk about the basic BFD configurations required on R1. First, we need to enable BFD on R1 and use the BFD BFD12 bind peer IP 192.168.12.2 source IP 192.168.12.1 command to configure a BFD session between R1 and R2. Then, configure the local discriminator and remote discriminator and run the commit command to allow the BFD session to take effect. Finally, associate the BFD session with the static route on R1. The BFD configurations on R2 are similar to those on R1. Note that the peer IP address and local IP address that need to be specified on R2 are opposite to their counterparts specified on R1, and the local discriminator and remote discriminator that need to be specified on R2 are also opposite to their counterparts specified on R1.